Hi, everyone. Dave Sugden of Evidence at Trial. Let's talk about the one thing that master trial lawyers always do in opening statement. Most lawyers rarely do. And in fact, textbooks and practice guides warn against. What am I talking about? Let's first talk about opening statement. This is the first chance where you get to talk to the jury after jury of selection, but talk to them specifically about what the case is about. And in fact, it's so important because this is the first time where they're going to hear from start to finish what we believe the evidence is going to show. And yet so often it's bungled and it's bungled in two ways. I'm going to first talk about how the plaint what the plaintiffs often don't do well, what the plaintiffs do well, and I'll do the same thing with the defense. First, when it comes to the plaintiff, oftentimes in jury selection, you'll hear plaintiffs talk about the burden of proof in civil cases. And the idea is, is that because the burden of proof in civil cases is lower than a criminal case, they want to start conditioning the jury to that reality. And so there's a bunch of tricks that plaintiff counsel use to sort of educate the jury about that in jury selection. And so they'll talk about the beyond a reasonable doubt standard in a criminal case, and they'll say, that's not what we have here. Here, we have a by the preponderance of the evidence standard. And lawyers have all these tricks and tactics as to how to explain that to a jury. And they'll talk about how if, if the scales of justice were even and just one feather was dropped on one side for the plaintiff by the end, that means beyond a by a preponderance of the evidence and the plaintiff must win. And so you'll hear plaintiff counsel explain that and then ask potential jurors, would any of you have a problem following that standard? And jurors don't really know what's going on and they just t typically agree to that. And let's stop for a moment and ask, is this helpful? Is this effective? And let me suggest it's not. Because if you, the first time you're talking to a jury, you're emphasizing this low burden of proof, what's the jury to think? First of all, they're reminded this is a lawyer because all of this by a preponderance of the evidence, reasonable doubt, those are all terms we don't hear every day. We hear them from lawyers. So you're reminding the jury, I'm a lawyer. Number two, let me suggest you're also telling the jury, I may have a weak case and I'm relying on this, what seems like a loophole or a legal trick, according to the many jurors, I'm, I'm relying on this loophole to hopefully win the case, and I'm trying to find jurors that will help me. And let me suggest, this isn't persuasive. It's just not. But what happens is they sort of use that jury selection time, and then an opening statement, they will use the phrase preponderance of the evidence a lot to remind them what that standard is. Now, what do plaintiffs do well in opening statement? Oftentimes what plaintiffs really do well is tell a story of the case. And they can essentially, because they're the plaintiff, they can almost use sort of the, the fairy tale standard to tell a story where it begins basically saying once upon a time, there was this plaintiff and it kind of paints a picture of what the plaintiff's life was like before the breach, before the termination, before the harm. And they can say something like there was this plaintiff and every day this plaintiff would describe what life was like before the harm until one day they then described the harm, sort of building up this climax. And then like any fairy tale, there's a hero. And who's the hero? The jury. Because what the plaintiff is able to implicitly communicate to the jury is that once upon a time, life was good until the defendant caused something bad to happen. And so who's the hero? The jury. They can do justice. And if justice is done, the plaintiff will live happily ever after. And they don't obviously use those words, but in terms of the chronology of the story, they're able to create that arc that resonates. That's what plaintiffs do well. But what they often do is emphasize this preponderance of the evidence standard, which I would suggest waters down all of it. Let's talk about defense now. In terms of defense counsel, what they will often do is they've worked so hard on the case, looking at legal elements the plaintiff may or may not be able to prove. They filed motions for summary judgment on certain legal arguments. For example, causation is not going to be proven or damages won't be proven. And so what happens when defense counsel get to trial? Too often they're thinking as a lawyer and they're thinking that 
what they argued in summary judgment, well, that can be a pretty persuasive legal argument. We'll just repackage that as an opening statement. And so they'll begin an opening statement emphasizing that they don't have any burden of proof. The plaintiff has the burden. And they'll argue things like they won't be able to prove this to you. They won't have sufficient evidence to prove this to you. And they'll start making legal arguments that, you know, even though this plaintiff is injured, we will argue or we will present evidence to suggest that these injuries were pre-existing or there isn't sufficient evidence to show that the harm the plaintiff suffered was caused by defense. And when you think of the fairy tale story, this other story just isn't persuasive. So what are lawyers to do when it comes to opening statements? And what do the master trial lawyers do? They assume the burden of proof for everything. And what they don't do is explain what that burden of proof means. What they do in opening statement is tell the jury, we will prove to you the following, whether they're the plaintiff or the defense. And to understand this, we're going to look at two trials where we see both an effective opening statement and an ineffective opening statement, both by defense counsel. The first case is the Michael Jackson case, the criminal case where he was accused of molestation. The, the trial attorney for Mr. Jackson was a guy named Thomas Mesereau, famous trial lawyer. So again, he is a criminal defendant. He's representing a criminal defendant in a criminal case. He has no burden of proof. In fact, the prosecution has to establish the case beyond a reasonable doubt. And yet, when you look at Mr. Mesereau's opening statement, you don't hear him talking about burden of proof at all. Instead, he assumes he has it. And what he tells the jury is, we will prove to you the following. He assumes the burden of proof. For example, he begins in his opening statement by saying, if he, the prosecutor, is to be believed, Mr. Jackson molested children and gave a cancer patient child alcohol to reduce his inhibitions and molest him. And I'm here to tell you that these charges are fictitious. They're bogus and they never happened. And I say to you right now, I am going to make some promises in this case. I am going to fulfill them and I want you to judge me accordingly at the end. These charges are fake, silly, ridiculous. He goes on, and Neverland, we will prove to you, is not a haven for criminal activity, a lure for molestation, a magnet for crime. It is none of these things. The prosecutor has tried to tell you it is. We will prove that in this case. And so what you see is we have a defense counsel without any obligation to prove anything. But this lawyer, Mr. Mesereau, knows how human beings decide things. They know how they analyze facts. He knows what will persuade the jury. And so even though he's the defendant, he assumes the burden of proof and tells them that he will prove these things to them. Let's now contrast that with another famous case, the Mar Martha Stewart insider trading case. And let's look at the defendant's opening statement in that case and compare it to Mr. Mesereau's. In the opening statement of Ms. Stewart's case, the lawyer began by saying, I want to start off with a very simple thought. And that simple thought is that Martha Stewart is innocent of all the charges here. And it is my view, and I predict after you have analyzed all of the evidence in this case, testimony in the documents, you will agree with what I just said. Let's stop there. Those are the first words out of Ms. Stewart's attorney. And let's ask ourselves, is that persuasive? Does that bring the jury in? Are they invited to follow more? Let me suggest just the idea of saying, here's an idea. Here's what I predict will happen. Let me suggest that's not persuasive. It's weak. He then goes on. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I apologize for being the third speaker, and I apologize for having to go over some of the same ground that my predecessors have gone over. But I tend to have a louder voice, so it should prevent you from dozing off. Again, let me suggest that's not persuasive. You never want to, the first time you're talking to a jury about what the case is about, minimize what you're going to say. When he says, I'm the third speaker, and talks about them potentially dozing off, what do they hear? They hear he has nothing new to say. That's not good. Now, let's look at the meat of what he says about his client. He says, This is an unusual case, not because Martha Stewart is a famous person, 
but because there will be no direct evidence introduced by the government that Martha Stewart conspired to obstruct anything, that what Martha Stewart told the government during her voluntary interviews was deliberately false, or that Martha Stewart was trying to fool investors in her company by accurately denying guilt and explaining her innocence in June of 2002. Now, this is a circumstantial case. For example, the government will argue that you can tell from telephone slips who was on the telephone and what was said on the telephone. That's what the government is going to argue here, and that's circumstantial evidence, not direct evidence. You must examine the quality of this kind of evidence very, very closely because circumstantial evidence almost invariably permits different inferences to be drawn, sometimes innocent, sometimes guilty inferences. And so again, we ask ourselves, compared to Mr. Mesereau, who said, I will prove to you, assuming the burden, Mr. Jackson's innocence, we have Martha Stewart's attorney saying, well, there's no direct evidence. We have circumstantial evidence that allows two inferences to be drawn, one guilty, one innocent. Is that persuasive? The jury's here thinking, when he's talking about direct and circumstantial evidence, we're not sure exactly what that means yet, but it sounds like a legal loophole. And when he's talking about, well, whatever the evidence is, there can be two ways of looking at it. Again, it sounds like a lawyer argument. It's not persuasive. And so what the master trial lawyers do is they don't use legalese and talk about the burden of proof, not until closing argument. And then you explain it to them and you say, I didn't have to prove anything, but I did. And here's why. What you see is both in jury selection and an opening statement, whether the master trial lawyers are the plaintiff or the defendant, they assume they have the burden. What they tell the jury is what they're going to prove. Way more persuasive than what we saw in Ms. Stewart's case. Folks, thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful. If it was, please like, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, if you want to do a deep dive and learn how to apply these rules, these tools, and make them strategies and become an effective trial lawyer, check out our courses at evidenceattrial.com. Thanks for watching.